This is June 2013. Question 1 is list two earth type uh, earth electrodes that may be used to connect an MEN system to the mass of earth. So two types of electrodes we can have an earth rod, a buried electrode, metallic reinforcing or an earth mat. The two main functions of the ballast, which is the choke in a fluorescent light fitting, where it's got two jobs. The, the first job I would say is, is to produce this high voltage when the starter opens to start the tube glowing. So the collapsing field in the choke produces a high voltage and that's what strikes the lamp. Um, its second job once it's running, once the lamp is on, is to limit that current flowing through the electrode and tube. C, an alternator has 48 poles. Now whenever you see 48 poles or any amount of poles, you know, in the formula, P is going to be half of that value because it's pairs of poles. So it's fed into an MEN distribution system. We're looking for the speed of rotation to enable it to feed into the distribution system. So we know it needs to be 50 hertz. Our speed over here is 60 F over P. Now that 60 just changes it into revs per minute. So if we didn't have that, we'd get an answer in revs per second. So 60 F over P, frequency is 50, the P is 48 divided by 2, which is 24, and it gives us 125 revolutions per, per minute. D, we've got an RCCB uh, protecting a 230 volt final sub-circuit, class 1. The RCCB is tripped. So why is it tripped? Well, it's tripped because there's been an imbalance between the two currents, between the phase and the neutral current. And the, why has there been an imbalance? Because there's been an earth leakage in the circuit. So some of that current has leaked out. The, there's an imbalance in the, the phase and neutral, and that leakage is greater than the residual tripping current of the RCCB. So dependent on the sensitivity of the RCCB, will depend how much current it takes to make that out of balance. E, BJT is a bipolar junction transistor. So that's our normal transistor. What's a trans transducer? A transducer is, is something that changes one form of energy to another. F, the main reason why it's important to consider prospective short circuit current when selecting a protective device. So this comes up again and again. The prospective short circuit current is the maximum current that will flow in the system under a fault condition. So obviously the protective device that we need, that we put in there needs to be able to clear a fault current of that value. So its value must be higher than that prospective short circuit current. G, we've got uh, an installation that needs a main earthing lead. To which parts of the electrical installations are the ends of the main earthing conductor um, connected? So they're connected to the it's connected to the earth bar at one end, and the earth electrode in the ground at the other end. What is required to be attached at one end of the main earthing lead? So this gets a little bit confusing. This the way they've asked asked this. <coughs> So we need uh, a notice warning against disconnection at the earth electrode. So that would be your answers for A and B if you were talking about the earth electrode. Or we need a notice at the switchboard stating the position of the earth electrode. Now if this comes up, I would, I would answer it this way, the, the notice warning about disconnection at the earth electrode. Define the time cutoff sorry, the term cut-off time as it applies. So the cut-off is the time it takes the fuse to interrupt the current flow. Now the total clearing time is this time to interrupt plus the time it takes to extinguish the arc. So total time is the time it takes to interrupt the flow of current and extinguish the arc. Whereas cut-off time is just when it um, interrupts the current flow. I, a thermistor, protects a three-phase uh, induction motor when a mechanical overload occurs. So how does it do that? 
so it, it's looking at temperature. It detects a rise in the temperature in the windings and it opens the control circuit when that preset temperature has been exceeded. So it knows when there's an over temperature. J part one, we're looking for the formula for power for an inductive free phase load. So this formula should be instilled in your, in your mind. Power is root free, VL, IL, power factor. A resistive single load, a single phase load, we just need power equals V times I. Question two, we've got a free phase star connected oven. We've got our free phases there and we, it's earthed and we've got a neutral on the star connection there. Each element draws a current of just over 26 amps. We've got a 40 amp fuse with a fusing factor of 1.5. So again, we've seen this before, 40 times 1.5 will tell you the actual current that it's going to blow at. So it's going to be 60 amps. The air fault loop impedance for the oven is 0.37. So that's that full um, impedance value. And that, but that also includes a protective earthen conductor resistance of 0.1. An earth fault of 14.7 has developed between L1 here and the oven frame. So it's touching the oven frame while the oven is operating. So what are we going to do? We're going to calculate the total current that will flow in L1 under fault load conditions. Now again, this is one where we need to find the fault current due to that fault plus the, full, uh, the current due to the load. So the total current is going to be the two added together. So the fault current is going to be V over R, so just basic Ohm's law, but this resistance is going to be a combination of the 0.37 of the um, earth fault loop impedance and the fault. So those two added together, divided into 230, gives us 15.26 amps. The total current that flows is going to be that 15.26 plus the 26.08 that we're told that the element takes just under normal load. So that gives us a total current of just over 41 amps. Use calculations to determine whether the fuse protecting L1 will operate. Now we know because of that fusing factor that it's going to take at least 60 amps to blow that fuse. And our fault current is only just over 41, so the fuse will not operate. Use calculations to determine the voltage that will appear on the frame of the, under, uh, the oven under fault conditions. So that current is going to continue to flow, and there's going to be volt drops within the system. Now the volt drop we're, we're interested in is across the frame and the resistance across the frame is that 0.1 ohms. So we've got 15.26 times 0.1 gives us 1.53 volts. So it's a, it's a very low voltage. State whether or not the air fault uh, causes a shock hazard to the user. I would say no. The voltage across the frame of the appliance is well below the touch voltage of 50 volts. So anything less than 50, they're saying, doesn't cause a danger to people. Number three, we've got a nameplate of a motor, and we're asked to find the power factor of the motor. We can see there, cos theta, cos theta is the power factor, is 0.82. And that 0.82 there. Use the information from the nameplate to calculate the kilowatt rating of the motor. Now, it's an old style motor because it's got the HP, the horsepower, 5.36. Now, the kilowatts is going to be the horsepower times 0.746. Now, this 0.746 is a fixed value, so it's the conversion from horsepower to kilowatts. And that gives us 4 kilowatts. We want to calculate the kilowatt rating of the motor. Sorry, that's what I've just done. Calculate the full load 
input kilowatts in the motor. So there's two ways we can do this. Um, we can look at the efficiency and the output because we've been given where's our output? We've been given the efficiency of 0.85 and we've just calculated our um, output efficient uh, output power of 4000 watts which is our 4 kilowatts there so our output divided by the efficiency will tell us the input 4000 divided by 0.85 gives us 4705.88 watts another way we could do it is to use that formula root free vl il cos theta root free times vl which is 415 so 415 there times 8.52, which is our current there, uh, uh, line current, times the power factor that we've got there, cos theta. And that gives us just over 5 kilowatts. So There's quite a big difference there, but you'd get the marks for either of those answers. So D, there's D. The motor has a protection rating of IP. 53, so what does IP mean? So it's international protection or ingress protection. I always remember it as international protection. What's indicated by the first number? So the first number is about the ingress, so the getting in of solid objects. And the second number is the ingress of liquids. What method is indicated by the symbol? So there's our delta symbol and there's our star symbol. So there there's delta and star. Various protection devices protecting the motor and final sub-circuit. So we're going to fill this table in to give a, a, a protection device. <clears throat> so short circuit, that could be HRC fuse or an MCV. Over temperature is our thermistor and phase polarity is a phase reversal relay. So that relay is looking if any of two of phases are reversed and then it will cut the power to the motor. Question four, we've got a three phase 400 volt three kilowatt induction motor with a star delta. Um, describe how to test the motor and attach cables to identify the motor windings. So we've got the motor windings, uh, the ends exposed how are we going to tell where the windings are? Well, we're going to use an ohm meter, and we're going to test between the cable ends in pairs, and we're going to try and find the pairs by the low resistance. So we're looking for three pairs of similar and low resistance. The cable supply in the motor is still, connect, uh, it's still connected to the motor. Two tests using test instruments need to be carried out. So when we're looking at two tests, we're always looking at earth continuity and insulation resistance. So there's going to be the two tests. Well, the first test is going to be earth continuity. For each of the two tests, state type of instrument, blah, blah. So we've done this lots of times before. Earth continuity, you're going to use ohm meter between the protective earthing conductor at the start of the cable and the frame. And we're going to make sure that uh, cable is less than 1 ohm or 1 ohm or less. Insulation resistance, insulation resistance tester, 500 volts DC, test between each of the windings, so winding 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 2 to 3, and then test between each of the windings and the motor framework. So we're making sure none of those windings are touching each other, and we're making sure none of those windings are touching earth. And we're looking for one mega ohm or more. Question five, we've got an office with um, 40 amp RCCB and 20 amp MCB protecting the 230 volt sub-circuit. We've got six double socket outlets with appliances and we've got two fixed wire electrical appliances. When operating normally, each appliance has a resistance of 8.54 so the MCB keeps tripping, it's not faulty. What do you need to do to ensure it's safe to locate the fault? Well, we're going to, whenever we think of safety and, 
isolation, we're looking at proof, test, proof. You've got to get those, those three words in there. So we're going to use proof, test, proof to, to confirm that the final subcircuit is isolated. Now we're going to do a test at the uh, switchboard to determine whether or not the fault is in the final subcircuit. So how are we going to do this? We're going to turn off those fixed appliances because we don't want them part of the test. We're going to use the insulation resistance function. We're going to select 500 volts. We're going to test between the load side of the MCB and the neutral bar. If there is a fault in the system, then we're going to get near zero ohms for the fault. If there's not a fault in there, we're going to get that one mega ohms or more. So the test result, if the fault is in the final sub-circuit, it's going to be a very low uh, resistance, near zero. If we find that it's not in the final sub-circuit, and then we're going to um, test the appliances, only one appliance can be tested at uh, a time. So what we're going to do, we're going to turn on the fixed wire appliance, select resistance, and we're going to select the lowest range or auto range, the lowest ohms. And we're going to test between the load side of the MCB and the neutral bar. If there is a fault in that appliance, then we will get a reading less than the 8.54. 8.54 is its normal operating resistance. If there's a short circuit in there, then we're going to get much less than that 8.54. Question 6. In New Zealand, the standard distribution system has the neutral blah, blah, blah. What is this called? It's our multiple earthed neutral, or MEN, system. Two technical reasons why the neutral conductor is earthed. So it limits the voltage to 230 to earth under fault conditions. It limits the voltage between neutral and earth to about zero volts. And it ensures under fault conditions the voltage between any earth metalwork and the mass of earth never rises above zero volts. So these are things that you, you must go into the, the, the test knowing. They come up again and again. In electrical insulation, the rupturing capacity of an MCB on the switchboard is underrated. So they're saying that it's not able to, to break uh, safely under the, the high fault currents. State two situations that could occur if a short circuit fault occurs on the final sub-circuit. So the MCB is unlikely to clear the fault. So we could get an arc in there and it could the fault could be sustained. The MCB may be destroyed, and we could get a current path created through the MCB. C. In electrical installation, the rupturing capacity of an MCB on the switchboard is overrated for the fault level. State two situations that occurred if a short circuit occurs on the final circuit that the MCB protects, well, I don't know, it can't come up to it because it's not going to affect it. We want the rupturing capacity to be more than the fault level of the installation. So their model answer is the MCB will interrupt the fault as intended. Just one answer. C, we've got 250 kVA, 400 volt free phase transformer, has a 5% impedance and we need to calculate the short circuit current. Now we get the short circuit current with the kVA so we've got 5000 kVA. How did they get that? We've only got 250 kVA. Root 3 times 400 the 5% so they've done 2, 250 divided by 0 0.05 to give us 5,000 kVA, divided by root 3 times 400. So that gives us 7.22 kiloamps. I'll do a pen cast for that question. 
to explain it a little bit better. Number seven, we've got a three phase delta star step down transformer, 150 kVA, and we've got a turns ratio of 287 to 1. And we've got 66 kV on the primary. So we need to calculate the secondary phase voltage. Now the secondary phase voltage is going to be 287 times less than the primary. So we've got 66 kV on the primary. There's our 66 kV there. Divided by that 287 gives us 229.97. So nearly 230 volts. That's our secondary phase. The secondary line is going to be root 3 bigger than that phase value because it's a star connected secondary the line voltage is root 3 bigger than the phase voltage and that gives us 398.31 the primary line current our formula is kva divided by root 3 times the primary voltage so that's a transposition of kva is il vl root 3 so there's our 150 kva divided by root 3 times 66 kV, which is our primary um, voltage on the line, and that gives us 1.31 amps. The secondary line current is going to be much bigger because the voltage is smaller. So kVA is 150 kVA again, divided by root 3 times 398.36, which is our secondary voltage, gives us 217.4 amps. State two conditions that occur when the secondary circuit of a CT is opened when the CT is live. So you should know that we should never have the secondary of a circuit uh, current transformer open circuited. So if we do, we could have a high voltage induced in the secondary circuit, the flux density in the CT rises, and the CT could be damaged. So it could be damaged by this high voltage induced in the secondary. Calculate a typical fusing current of a 20 amp GG rated. So the, the GG, the general one, is going to be, if we take a fusing factor, of 1.5. So 20 times 1.5 gives us 30 amps. Now a GM, the motor one, is going to have a higher fusing factor, and it's going to be around that 2. So 2 times the 20 will give us 40 amps. What occurs in electrical insulation when a fault uh, occurs? There is correct discrimination. So if we've got correct discrimination, then we should um, operate the protective device nearest the fault. That opens or operates before any other protective device. State what is meant by the term current rating applied to an HRC fuse. I always think of current rating is the current it can take all day, every day. So it's the maximum current that the fuse is designed to carry continuously. From the chart, select the minimum fuse uh, size fuse that will provide discrimination for a 100 amp fuse if the fuse is downstream is the downstream fuse, that is the closest to the load. Provide an explanation for your selection. So we need a fuse downstream that's got a pre-arc in time which is greater than the 100 amp fuse. Now the 100 amp fuse has got 17 and a total clearing of 60. So we need a fuse that's got a bigger pre-arcing time than this total clearing time. And that fuse is this one, which is the 160 amps. So you're saying this, this won't blow before this one totally clears. So there's no danger of this one going. So if there's a fault in the system, this one will go first. E, 
you've carried out an earth fault roof and peanuts test and domestic insulation and we've got a fault level of 1.2 kiloamps. On the switchboard there are three rewirable fuses. Now rewirable fuses are not very good fuses for interrupting big currents. Um, they are only rated for one kiloamp, no more. So they won't safely rupture under the stated fault conditions. They could, could cause an arc and it could, could get a sustained current. It might not be able to break that current. The rewirable fuses must be replaced with MCBs. State one reason why MCBs are used to repay. Well, the MCBs are rated up to 10 kiloamps, so they'll easily be able to interrupt 1.2. And they'll, they'll say they're safely open under the stated fault conditions. <laughs> Question 9. We've got a 230 volt class 1 electrical appliance. It's got semiconductor devices uses in, in internal circuitry. So as soon as you see um, semiconductor devices, we know that we can't test at that uh, 500 volts DC without taking, taking precautions. So we want to do an insulation resistance test and we've got an insulation resistance test of with 100 volts DC and 250 volts DC. Describe how you test the integrity of the insulation using this instrument, wherever it needs to be live and a test result that permits the appliance to be put back into service. So we need to have the, the appliance disconnected. The appliance needs to be dead. We we're going to select the 250 volt range and we're going to test between the phase pin and the frame of the appliance and between the neutral pin and the frame of the appliance or, and I would consider this the best, better answer, bridge the phase and neutral pins and test between that bridge and the frame of the appliance and then there's no danger of that 250 um, getting across the phase and neutral. So bridge out the phase and neutral, test to earth and we're looking for a test result of 1 mega ohms or more. Number two, we've got same same um, appliance, but we've got an insulation resistance tester that's only got the 500 volts DC and the 100 vo uh, thousand volts DC ranging. So how we're going to test this? We would um, again disconnect the appliance. We would go for the 500 volt DC. Again. We could do it between each one and earth or bridge the appliance, uh, bridge the face neutral and test to earth for the appliance. And we're looking for a test result of one meg or more. Test the integrity of the installation. You have a clip on ammeter with milliamp range. So, how do we test this? Now, this one, it needs to be live because we need to be testing if there's any leakage current. So it needs to be plugged in, it needs to be on. We clamp the meter around the protective earthing conductor and we look for a current that's 5 milliamps or less. So anything over 5 milliamps and that will fail the test. We've repaired an electric motor and a flexible supply cord. You need to carry an earth continuity protective earthing conductor test. What instrument we're going to be using? We're going to be using an ohm meter. How we're going to carry out the test? We're going to test between the earth pin of the plug and the frame of the dishwasher. And test result that permits the dishwasher to be returned to service is one ohm or less.